So thank you, Gary, and good evening. I think everybody knows me in here, but my name is Brian Harris. I'm the fire chief for the town of Munson. Um, I'd like to begin this presentation just by going over a, a brief uh, overview of the history of the Munson Fire Department. Uh, some people that uh, have been in town quite a, quite a while know most of the history or, or some of it, and then I'm sure some people do not. Um, so if we go back to 1715, uh, the first person settles in Munson and as the town grew to 49 families, the need for fire protection grew. The Munson Volunteer Association was formed. This remained the sole source of fire protection until May 2nd, 1887, uh, when the Munson Fire Department was formed at a meeting of the Board of Selectmen. In 1895, the town occupied two fire stations located at Fountain Street and Main Street. The Main Street station still stands today. Uh, it's currently occupied by uh, KBG Construction in the dance studio. In 1921, the Munson Fire Department acquires its first piece of motorized fire apparatus. In 1933, a combination pumper and hose carrier was purchased. And then 1941, um, around the time of World War II, the Rotary Club donated a McKesson resuscitator inhaler. Uh, this was used for suffocation by smoke, drowning, or other emergencies. This is the first documented piece uh, the department, of the department providing medical care to either its citizens and or its firefighters. And in 1951, all of our trucks are now equipped with two-way two radios. In 1956, a Packard ambulance is donated to the department by the Rotary Club again. Prior to this acquisition, an ambulance, if needed, would respond from Palmer Hospital. Um, in 1960, the Munson Fire Department purchases its first new ambulance. Uh, in 1961, Munson Fire Department holds its first first aid class. Uh, this was for firefighters, and then eventually we uh, added it to four citizens. 1978, the existing facility is built to replace a drastically undersized and outdated fire station on Main Street. Um, at the 1987 town meeting, two votes are passed to employ the first full two full-time EMTs, and the second one uh, was to vote to have a full-time fire chief. Today, a station built for a 100% volunteer fire department has 24 hour a day, seven day a week coverage with career staff at the station. We employ eight firefighter EMTs or paramedics, a fire chief and administrative assistant along with near, nearly 20 on-call firefighters who respond from home when needed. In the last 136 years since the department has been officially formed, we have seen many technological advancements, changes and demands uh, in the fire service, some of which will be, will be discussed tonight. Many of these changes have required uh, that the fire service adapt and change with it in order to protect our personnel and most importantly, our citizens. We have come to a point where our fire station is no longer meeting the needs of the service uh, or the community we serve. Thank you. Good evening. Again, I'm Rebecca Hopkins. I'm an associate and project manager with Tecton Architects. With me today is Jeff McElroy. He is a principal and the director of our public safety market. Um, we've been working together for over 10 plus years now on public safety projects specifically um, with, a spoke, with a focus on fire station design. Um, and Jeff brings over 35 years of experience um, in exactly that market as well. So the chief kind of laid some great groundwork on some of the things that we focused on, and I'm gonna walk through the feasibility study, um, noting some of the items um, that currently are either not conforming conditions or really do not align with current best practices um, within your existing station, and then kind of where we went from, from that point. So from an existing conditions assessment standpoint, ourselves, all of our engineers, we go out to the existing station and we look at a num number of different aspects of the building, um, not only for the, from a physical or system standpoint, but also from an operations standpoint. So a few of those key conditions that we noted was anything that is non-conforming. Um, and when we talk about non-conformance, understanding that the building was built according to a previous code, that does not necessarily mean it's not conforming, it's conforming to the code from which it was built on. Um, but this really denotes anything that doesn't meet 
the code um, currently. So the use of your second floor, how was it originally permitted? What types of spaces exist up there and what types of means of egress are provided from there? So we really did focus on that second floor. Um, structural integrity, um, so looking at the load capacity of that second floor um, and if it was designed accordingly, um, and also water damage of the exterior walls. One thing that we noticed immediately was that water was getting in along the exterior wall from the roof condition. Um, when I was on site myself, we popped a few ceiling tiles and all of the end of the wood joists were actually saturated um, with water as they hit that exterior masonry wall. We look at health and safety conditions. Um, this is very much in alignment with current best practices. Um, there has been a ton of research over the past, uh, I'd say five to 10 years on carcinogens and different contaminants that come back from a fire scene um, when they're on your person, on your gear, on your equipment, and how do you um, properly contain those? Um, we talk about a hot zone and a cold zone, ensuring that we're keeping kind of all of those contaminants in certain areas of the station and allowing for proper personal and equipment decontamination um, to ensure that the um, firefighters are remaining safe as they function, live, and work in that station. We looked at all of the different systems from your mechanical system, vehicle exhaust, general apparatus bay exhaust, um, we look at fire alarm, emergency lighting, et cetera. So all of our engineers kind of focus on their specific systems. Um, and we also look at operational um, kind of practices from the, the live and workspaces into the bays. Um, from a research standpoint, over 44% of actual injuries occur within the station, so not on the scene of a fire. Um, it's really important that you're keeping all those proper clearances around your vehicles as you're loading and unloading those vehicles and responding quickly to a fire. Um, so we do, we do look at kind of that spacing and that overall sizing of the apparatus base themselves. We look at accessibility, accessibility again to the apparatus bay, but also from a public standpoint. If there's a visitor or someone seeking medical attention, um, it is very common that they go visit the fire station, ensuring that that is easy and accessible to the public. This, except, this um, assessment also kind of steps outside of the building. So we do, although we kind of are just focusing in on some of the specifics of the building itself, we do look at site layout. Um, this, how the current station is positioned um, is on a shared site, as many of you probably know, um, shared with highway, water, and sewer, and access to different residential tenants and um, uh, public tenants. So one thing that was a concern is whenever you have a full-time and volunteer station, you have to not only handle responding apparatus and ensuring that response route um, is unencumbered, but also where are those volunteers coming to, where are they parking, and what's their flow from the site into the apparatus bay and then out onto the, um, then out off of the site. Um, ensuring that that is clear um, and safe um, allows for that quick response and the best service to the community. So it is a bit of an insulated site. There is only a single point of access. Um, so from it is removed, so that does impact the response time. And again, if there was ever a hazard or something related to traffic right at that one curb cut, that would limit the um, department's ability to get off of site. Um, minimal parking and a few other um, kind of concealed main entry and points that we noted during this conditions assessment. I touched on the building exterior, so it is a CMU or cement block wall construction. Um, there is some visible cracking, and again, we were concerned specifically with water damage um, and how that was affecting the structural integrity of the station itself. Most of the doors are not ADA compliant, um, and from an energy standpoint, it is the, the energy codes have uh, come leaps and bounds since the station was originally built. Um, so from that standpoint, and upgrades would be definitely recommended um, to ensure that your systems are functioning um, at a, at a um, operational level um, that really is supportable long-term um, for the town. The main entry, again, is in an unclear kind of tucked away near this uh, near a utility shed off to the side of the facility. Um, so it does not really accurately reflect um, the pride and the respect that the fire department and the quality of the service that the fire department provides. A few other noted conditions on the interior, um, all of the restrooms um, really lack um, 
conformance uh, to current standards. Um, they've obviously been renovated as much as possible um, to ensure uh, that they can be utilized um, to the best of their ability. Um, but really, again, focusing on that decontamination process, um, these are just typical restrooms, um, and there's much more that can be done from, from a design standpoint. And that second floor, again, that second floor was originally designed as a mechanical utility space. It has extremely low headroom, um, well below the code minimum, um, and it currently is housing multiple uses. Um, so that includes some office space, that's their main day room living area, their conference meeting area outside of the training room, which also is um, hindered by multiple uses, uh, multiple bunk rooms, fitness rooms, storage rooms, uh, you name it, it's up there. So um, it is, is very full of programmatic uses that it was never really designed to support. Um, that main floor training room, which is a room I think many are uh, familiar with if you have visited the station, um, also doubles as a report writing area, a kitchen, um, so internal training, external training, and is also the main thoroughfare into the apparatus bay for response. Um, we do look for possibilities of multifunctionality when we are looking at design um, opportunities and new designs. Uh, we never want a space to sit vacant and unused for long durations of time, so the right type of multifunctionality is very beneficial from a space design standpoint. But you do reach a point where there's a loss of functionality when too many types of day-to-day of -day functions are kind of shoved into a singular space. I mentioned some of the apparatus bay um, can, you know, operational concerns. Um, one thing to note in this image is that you can see that most of the firematic support equipment is sitting directly on the apparatus bay floor. Um, so outside of that providing you know, or causing some of those tight operational movements around the vehicles, it also, again, is exposing all of that equipment to all of those carcinogens that are coming back from the fire scene. Um, so current best practices um, take all of that equipment, all of those different support and storage spaces um, and close them um, individually and put them immediately adjacent to the apparatus space. So proximity is really important, um, but you do want that separation so that we can control uh, the flow of air, um, the pressurization to ensure that we are not pulling carcinogens onto clean equipment. We are not filling oxygen tanks within contaminated zones. And I think another thing to note here is you can kind of see how close some of these vehicles get to the front doors from a length and width standpoint. Another thing that we also noted is a height standpoint. So current apparatus based standards include a 14 by 14 foot door. Um, those kind of align with maximum requirements for your streets. Um, but also the, the width is important. So you look at anywhere from about, uh, probably about an average of 20 foot width bay um, to ass again, assure that you've got that four foot clearance going around the entirety of the vehicle. Um, there is opportunity to stack vehicles um, and coordinate response, so that does not necessarily mean that one bay is one vehicle. You can stack them according to their size, um, but that does eliminate the need to customize, vehicle, customize vehicles when um, replacing or retiring old apparatus. So part one of this study, so once we had kind of completed that conditions assessment, um, was let's look at an addition renovation for the full program. Um, so the full programmatic need determined by the department, which is basically based on multiple interviews. Uh, we talk through all of the different uh, operations and spatial needs from your office to your storage needs, um, and we translate that into square footage. Um, that original space needs assessment came to about 20,200 square feet. So in this option, we were looking at an addition renovation to the existing station. And here's a rendering and a site plan of how we were accomplishing that. So it included multiple apparatus bay additions and a kind of, we'll call it office living addition on either side of the existing station. And the total probable cost of that came in at around 15.9 million. Option two was a new construction option. Um, the space needs of that was about 19,400. And again, both of these solutions were based on that original program. That original program from a space standpoint was closer to this 19,400. And the reason for the discrepancy between an addition renovation and the new construction is that whenever you are designing within an existing asset or within an existing building, there's innate inefficiency because you're working within the constraints of that structure. 
So a new construction scheme, when you have a clean slate, typically is more efficient um, and aligns closer with the programmatic need determined when you're just listing out the spaces and all of the different room requirements for each of those spaces. So this solution was an alternate site, um, and the cost of that came in around 16.1. So the cost point at the for both of those were very similar, um, but it seemed that they were out of reach for the community of Munson. Um, so it was requested that we kind of take a second look at that program and look at ways where we can come up with some solutions that are a little bit more financially feasible. So again, we looked at that original program of around that 19 to 22,000 square feet. We looked at the allocation of what was included in that program. Um, so looking at things that were mission critical, spaces that I mentioned relative to the apparatus bay and the firematic support space, um, and then also looking at office space and living quarters and what components or percentages did those make up this overall ask or this overall square footage. And we met with the department um, at large, so every individual of the department, full-time and volunteer, were, was invited and we had multiple sessions and we created a list of priorities, um, starting with the question of if you could get one thing, what would it be? If we could solve two things, what would they be? And we started building a list of what would be the most important problems to solve. If we can't solve everything, uh, if we can't solve operational issues for the next 50 plus years, what if we focus on the next 10 years, 15 years? The priorities determined were these nine priorities. Number one, decontamination. Number two, living quarters. Number three, locker room and shower room, again, aligning with that decontamination. Bay congestion and bay quantity, so focusing on operational safety, as well as housing all of the current equipment to ensure longevity. Separate training and classroom space, so addressing that, that overloaded multifunctionality that currently exists within the station. Separate public entry, clearly identifiable. And then kind of following that was additional administration, administrative space and additional adjacent storage space. So with this reduced program, we kind of took those priorities um, and, and kind of took cuts at the program and determined square footages for each of these solutions. Um, we came up with about 10 plus solutions with multiple configurations. Um, they were very much um, intended to be uh, combined in many different ways. So although there was just 10 solutions presented, it was a wide range of building sizes and you can kind of take components of each of them and combine them um, to really maximize uh, the flexibility, whatever that ultimate solution would be. So we looked at, again, we had that part one, which is on the far left of your screen, which is that solution one and two. And then we determined these additional uh, A through H options um, as a part of part two of the study. And in this case, we had solutions ranging from 3 million um, all the way up to 15.6. And I'll, I'll specifically address option F. Option F was a exploration and a different type of construction. So option F was not based on that reduced program. Option F was based on the full program, but it was a pre-engineered building um, with a wood framed adjacent uh, addition. So it was really looking at, is there a difference between, you know, a uh, stud construction, metal stud construction, or masonry-like construction, and a pre-engineered wood-type construction. Um, and really what it proved is that uh, the costs were very much, very much similar um, due to the fact that as an emergency response facility, um, it is, has one of the highest um, requirements from a resiliency standpoint, according to the building code. So once you've um, adjusted that pre-engineered metal building, um, you've really increased that cost per square foot. So it really doesn't drive, it really drives up that cost, making it more equivalent to um, traditional conventional construction. So these again were presented at different points of time um, according to the, the parts in the study. Um, but one thing we did do for this presentation is escalate all of those out to the fall of 2024. And I'll talk a little bit about escalation, um, but ensuring that these numbers are current to the current are current um, and accurate for the current project schedule. Um, so these are would be the accurate cost of all of these solutions if you were to move forward with them um, after the Springtown meeting. So just to highlight a few of the different components of these options, um, option E became the preferred option by the building committee and, as well as the select board, um, and that is the option we will dive a little bit deeper into tonight. Um, but 
Option A had actually multiple different um, components of it. It was a renovate only. It was very much a, we are not addressing any of the priorities. It is immediate improvements only. Um, really very much the Band-Aid approach. Let's fix what is breaking um, and ensure that the firefighters can operate safely, safely within the facility. So really buying a very minimal amount of time. And we talk when we talk about lifespan, we're not talking about the building is literally going to fall down. Um, we're talking about how long that will operationally support um, the department. Um, so in this case, you're really not buying yourself any more time from an operational standpoint because it's not addressing any of the programmatic needs. Option B is a single story addition. Uh, it addressed about five of the nine needs. Uh, again, kind of working our way up, we then did that same single story addition with a small bay addition, apparatus bay addition, um, addressing more of that bay than we were able to address the bay quantity and the bay congestion. Um, Working our way down, option D worked into a two-story addition. Um, again, being able to address some of those more work and living um, priorities. And then option E builds on that. So not only being able to address the live work uh, priorities, but also address those apparatus bay priorities as well, meeting all nine of the priorities. So option E. So it includes a two-story addition and a medium apparatus bay addition. So this is the two-story addition here, which would be um, pretty much built exactly where the front entry is today. And a medium apparatus bay addition on the opposite side of the station. So again, these two, this, this solution um, included a 5,500 new two-story addition a 3,600 square foot bay addition, and renovation to the existing station, which included about 1,800 square feet of office space and 4,500 square feet of apparatus bay space. From a floor plan configuration standpoint, you can see here in light gray, this is the existing footprint of the facility. Again, the main door today is right about here. So we would be proposing in this solution one new addition on the left and one new addition on the right. You'd approach the facility from south of your page. The main entry door is kind of facing that approach, um, you know, unsimilar to today or dissimilar to today, where that entry is off to the side and kind of tucked in behind. You would arrive right at the station, public parking right in front with that front lobby door. You would immediately be greeted by the administrative assistant um, with a service window and kind of a lobby, um, which would allow connectivity to that training community space, um, which would also function as an emergency operations center if needed, um, could be utilized by the community and could also be utilized for department trainings. This is specifically dedicated to those functions. So if there's CPR training or anything else, a community event, um, this is not also the space that the firefighters are writing reports or making dinner um, or any of those other types of functions. Those functions have been pulled into separate facilities. Has a few support spaces as well as a few building um, mechanical or utility spaces. And then within this lower level of the addition is an elevator and stair servicing the second floor and then some office space. Within the existing facility, the current apparatus space would remain in place. We are proposing one additional overhead door to provide that um, kind of third access point in the rear of the station. Um, but th these bays would still be limited from a size, spacing, and capacity standpoint because um, we are not increasing the size of any of them. We are removing all of the equipment within the bays um, to help alleviate that pressure, um, but they are remaining under their current kind of height, width, and uh, length conditions. Within the current portion of the building, that is really your restrooms and offices and that large training multifunction space today, we would be renovating those spaces accordingly. Um, so we would include a radio room, an additional office space, renovate those toilet shower rooms, and reconfigure the training room into a proper decontamination transition zone. Um, so this would allow for proper personal decontamination. It would allow for easy access of volunteer firefighters to arrive, grab their gear, um, respond to the appropriate piece of apparatus, and then leave the station. That turnout gear is all now off of the apparatus bay floor. It currently fills uh, one, of the, one of these bays here, indicated in the rear. 
Um, and that would, again, we've, we've placed these uh, showers and restrooms right off of that hallway to really support that, that full transition and separation between the hot zone of the facility and the cold zone of the facility. On the opposite side of those existing apparatus bays, we are proposing a few firematic support spaces, again, to get that equipment off of the apparatus bay floor into separate enclosed spaces so that we can control the pressurization, but ensure easy access, again, to not uh, hinder response time. This includes your SCBA or those oxygen tanks I mentioned, uh, decontamination of equipment, so that gives you also the ability to come in right out from outside of the station so that you're not um, traversing in the station or tracking anything with you. If something is highly contaminated, it can be brought right into that space. It does also include a one large apparatus bay, um, again, to current best practices standards from a size standpoint, as well as kind of side access for some additional equipment in the rear as well as a small apparatus in the back here. This would allow for all current equipment, which is currently, some of which is currently housed outside, to be housed indoors. And the flexibility of future growth um, and to not require the customization of vehicles as vehicles retire. As you move up to the second floor, I'll go back to that main stair and elevator. This is really all of the, those, that um, firefighter living and working space. Um, so you have a properly separated dining, kitchen, day room area, and um, appropriate sized and designed uh, living quarters or bunk rooms um, with associated showers and restrooms. The storage mezzanine, which is your current second floor, which houses all of those different functions um, that I rattled off earlier, um, would return to its original intent um, and how it was originally designed to be a full storage mezzanine and to house any of the mechanical um, electrical um, equipment necessary to service the entire facility. One opportunity we did look to leverage um, is that the apparatus bays are naturally taller uh, volumes. Um, with that being said, these storage spaces don't always require those same types of height. Um, so we do propose putting a uh, floor on top of those with a railing, and that allows for some additional mezzanine space um, to accommodate some of that additional storage that we were not able to fully include into this solution that was a part of the original list of programmatic needs, um, as well as training opportunities within the bays themselves. Um, you can do a lot of different um, ladder drills and repelling drills right within the bay um, off of those types of mezzanines. Some views potential views of what those additions would look like um, from an exterior materiality standpoint. Um, again, because these solutions were very cost conscious, um, we are proposing um, materials that are durable, low maintenance, um, but are not huge cost drivers. Um, so in most cases, we are, we are either recommending a um, masonry uh, block construction or a clapboard side um, siding type construction. Um, this would be a cementitious product, so you get the durability and the low maintenance, um, but it comes at a lower cost than a full brick construction, for example. So the overall project cost um, currently for the solution is $6.6 .6 million. Um, again, this includes multiple different components of the total um, project uh, budget. Uh, so it's not just your bid cost, but it includes multiple other components. So again, the total square footage for the solution is 17,200 square feet, um, with the new addition being at 5,500. The renovation being at 1,800 for the office space, a renovation of 4,500 for the apparatus bay, as well as a new medium apparatus bay addition at 3,600 square feet. So from a construction cost standpoint, this is really the, we'll call it the brick and mortar, and in this case it's not brick and mortar, but this is your hard construction number. So this is the number you would receive on bid day from your general contractor. This includes all of their their hard costs. Um, it also includes their overhead and profit, anything that's required for bonds and insurance, um, as well as um, kind of their escalated quantities for all of the material and labor uh, required to fulfill the contract documents. So that component of this is around, oh, jumped on me. That component of this is around 5.2, 5.3 million. Um, so it is the majority of the overall budget, um, but it is one of three pieces to the overall budget. 
In addition to the construction costs, um, we always want to give a full picture of what it will take to complete the overall, the, the project itself, not just that bid number. Um, and there's a lot of other project development and equipment costs required um, to kind of bring that project to full operation. These include design fees, um, any type of clerk of the work fees, um, an OPM fee in the state of Massachusetts, permitting requirements, material testing requirements, bidding costs, legal fees, insurance, you name it. So it's all of those additional project development costs that are really required to bring that project to fruition. Um, and that is coming in around $870,000. Uh, $870, and then that third and final component is contingency. Um, understanding that this is a public project, uh, there is one time you, you can ask for money, you can only go to the well once, we want to ensure um, that when this number is presented at town meeting, it is the final number and we can work within that requested quantity. Um, so there are two components to project contingency. One is a construction slash owner's contingency um, that is sitting at a little higher of a percentage than we typically carry for a new construction because you do have a renovation included in the scope of this project. Um, there's always the opportunity for unknown, um, although we can do numerous types of testing during design um, and development, uh, there is always the opportunity to you open something up or you start to demo something and you find something that you are not expecting. Um, so there's a 7.5% um, construction cost contingency. It also allows for any modifications, emissions, errors, um, or owner changes that occur during the overall process of construction. Um, as well as a project development contingency of 5%. So those two percentages really build on um, the first and second bucket, ensuring that you know, the budget's carried within the project development um, portion of this budget. You're gonna receive actual quotes. They may vary slightly so that everything can be properly executed and installed um, and the building can be fully operational by the time you are complete. So Jamie is here, you're the town's finance director, and she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, sample financing options um, and some hypothetical um, projections that were run um, in a few different scenarios. Hi, my name is Jamie Farnham, and I am the finance director for the town of Munson. Uh, I've been uh, working closely with the fire chief and Tecton and our financial advisor um, just to come up with some scenarios of what that would look like um, if this project was approved at the annual town meeting in spring. Uh, that uh, this project would require a debt exclusion. Um, since we're in the restraints of the restraints of Prop Two and a Half, a debt exclusion um, is above and beyond that two and a half to be able to fund the project and the debt costs included. And so this slide here um, talks about the uh, hypothetical project budget of based off seven million. As mentioned, it was six point six million. Um, we did go off worst case scenario and we um, rounded up to seven million. Um, and at town meeting, though, uh, we're working with how to draft that article. Um, just to make sure that we are authorizing up to the amount that we'll need to bond. And the um, this assumes a 20-year term. Um, we, there was a... Uh, uh, equal principal debt schedule put together by our financial advisors, and uh, we're, this is based off... Um, the total assessed valuation, and then for example purposes, we use 300,000 as assumed home valuation, and, and based on a 3.75 interest rate. And so the average impact based on assumed home value, again, that's all assumed numbers. This could you know fluctuate depending on um, home value and uh, just the, the budget and everything else impacted. So it's not saying, you know, this is what your bill will go up to, to a certain amount, but just on an average, um, what we're basing it off of on this example. And so um, this is based on 300,000. So if your home was assessed at 300,000, it would be between um, 207 and $123 per year. Uh, I also put together, um, that is based off the, off the fiscal year 22 home assessed values um, or the valuation. And it did go up in fiscal year 23, and that actually brings that um, 207 down to 177. So that's just an example um, that depending on the assessed values of the home and when we're putting everything together for the tax rate recap, um, that can fluctuate. So it is based off um, an estimate of on any given fiscal year uh, what that looks like. 
Uh, the other thing that I did want to talk about is I put together kind of a range. Um, I know when I last spoke at the senior center, um, one of the question was because, you know, be, the example this is based on is 300,000. So say we said your assessed value was 150,000, the average in, annual increase would be $85. Um, the 300,000 mark is between that 207 number and say 550,000 assessed value, that's $320 um, average increase on an annual basis for your tax bill. Um, and again, these are all based on um, just sample scenarios. And the other thing I'd just like to mention is that when we, if this project is approved at town meeting moving forward, um, we would begin with short-term borrowing. And then um, once we actually bond for the project and we have the exact amount, that's when it would be coming on the tax rate. So that does take time and be at the conclusion of the project. Um, and currently, we have, based on our um, debt exclusion schedule, we, as of fiscal year 2022, we had four uh, projects that are debt exclusions. There was the middle school construction, high school construction, the town hall police station construction, and the, the newly added um, Quarry Hill roof construction. Um, since uh, certifying for fiscal year 23, the high school construction debt rolled off, which was a total of, um, that was 214,000 a year. And that rolling off, we brought on the Quarry Hill roof construction and that's 161,200. And that number is based on the principal and interest payment um, associated with the debt. So there was a little bit of savings there because we had authorized for Quarry Hill roof construction about 5.1 million and the project came in at 2.7 million. Um, so you will see actually the, us uh, rescinding the difference at a future town meeting. Um, so with the high school construction rolling off, Quarry Hill coming under, um, the middle school construction debt is actually also rolling off in 2024. So if we're timing this right, um, and be, it'll, be coming on, the fire station debt would be coming on when the uh, middle school construction is uh, rolling off. And when we're looking at this, I know it was mentioned when we originally looked at the you know 15 to um, $16 million project, we're looking at all of our municipal buildings. And so we were trying to come up with the most cost effective to be able to um, continue to take care of our buildings while also looking at um, the overall um, financial health of the town and uh, you know the other needs of other municipal buildings. Um, so that is just a little bit about um, the financial background of the project. Does anybody have any questions? Great, right. well, thank you so much. Thanks, Jamie. And we can circle back if there are any questions um, specific to the financing or some of those hypothetical scenarios. Um, one thing that um, does tie directly to that is the potential project schedule and when this debt um, could be coming on um, from a fiscal year standpoint um, and from a debt schedule, kind of what that looks like. Um, so if this project were approved at the annual town meeting um, this spring and subsequently voted um, subsequently approved um, for the debt override um, on the ballot, uh, we would immediately begin into design development. Uh, so this kind of breaks down all of our different uh, steps required to kind of go out to bid and begin construction. Um, so if that budget were approved in May or June this year, um, we would proceed into design development. Subsequent to that, we would do construction documentation. Really during those phases, we're focused on um, detailing um, every kind of piece and component of the overall design. Um, all of our engineers come fully on board um, and include um, all of their drawings and specifications. Um, what you're looking at here was you know, a few pages. Um, these sets end up being hundreds of pages um, with thousands of pages of specifications tied to them. Um, so there's a lot of detail um, that is written into the requirements um, that the contractor will be held to. Um, we then go out to advertise the project for bidding. We would then include a filed sub-bid period and a general bid period. Um, and once those bids were received, the um, 
lowest, typically lowest, most responsive and eligible bidder would be awarded the project. Um, once that contract was awarded, um, within that total project budget, um, construction would start and that contractor would mobilize. Um, from a project schedule standpoint, this would be targeting next spring, so spring of 2024, um, right when the weather breaks. Um, we will always be conscious of other projects that are hitting the streets at the same time. Um, you never want to go up against a big school. You want to make sure that the contractors are sharp their pencils and have the time and capacity to look at projects like this. Um, but starting a project in that early spring um, usually results in great response because they're trying to kind of uh, firm up uh, work for a team for the following year. So in this case, we were, we were including a construction schedule um, where we would administer that contract um, and hold the contractor to all of those contract document requirements, um, basically spring of 2024 through the spring of 2025. So with a completion in and around April, May of 2025. So again, kind of preferred option and potential next steps It is the recommendation of the Building Assessment Committee and the Select Board to proceed with option E at the $6.6 .6 million budget. Um, we will continue to have community outreach presentations. Um, this was our third tonight, but our fourth is scheduled for a Saturday in April, uh, April 8th at the Munson Fire Station. So it will be very much an open, uh, kind of open house as well as a high level presentation, um, but very much in a, the opportunity to experience um, and see a lot of those existing conditions. Um, and we will continue to build on the financing, uh, the uh, debt over, the debt that is rolling off and rolling on and continuing to add detail um, on that potential uh, taxpayer impact. And then that eventual step is a presentation at the annual town meeting. With that, I wanna thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd, we'd be happy to address them. amount of space for the fire trucks. And I see in your plans that that really has not changed, if I understood you correctly. Which is a concern. I would think we would want wider doors, taller doors, uh, for future, future equipment. Uh, I don't know I don't know where it fits into the whole thing, but it seems to me that that's what you have now. It's not significantly changed for the larger pieces of equipment, with the exception of the new bay. Um, but I'm concerned with the width and the height of the parking areas for uh, what is now a cramped situation. Hmm. And believe me, I know because I have wandered through the equipment from time to time. Can that be addressed in any way? You, you look like you want to take it. Do you want to take it? I'd be happy to, but <laughs> if you just want to repeat the question so they can hear it on the recording. Yeah, the question is uh, based on the design drawing that's up there that the, uh, the apparatus bays themselves, uh, many of them are not significantly larger uh, than what exists today. And that's absolutely true. Um, you know, in order to bring the cost down, um, we had to, to look at, you know, where the opportunities lie and, you know, a substantial portion of the existing building, uh, which is the real asset that we had to help us re to, to reduce the cost, is those apparatus bays. Um, so we were not able to build new bays within this kind of a budget um, using today's standards, which would be more like 18 feet center to center. And we would make sure that we had four feet between the front and back of every vehicle, um, and then 14 by 14 doors. Um, what we were able to do is get all of the equipment off of the floor. So if you looked at those pictures earlier on, you saw that um, alongside the apparatus is the turnout gear along the wall, and there's all sorts of equipment. So not only do you have a, a narrow space to start with, but it's even more restricted um, by the equipment that's lining that wall or also on the floor. So we've gotten all of that equipment off the floor to open up space. Um, so we do have more room. And you also notice that you've got, I don't know, about 
looks like about two and a half inches from the bumper to the door. Exactly by opening, out. yeah, by opening up the bays um, and getting all of that equipment out, we're able to spread the vehicles out. You see in that picture, we've got more like three feet uh, between the, 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 the vehicles and the doors. Um, so it's not an ideal situation. Um, you know, new construction would, would give us much bigger bays, um, but it is, it is the most significant way for us to, to manage the cost um, and still improve the situation that the department is dealing with today. If you blew out that front wall where the doors are, blew that out and widened them up, you would have more uh, yes, it would be significant cost, but more importantly, there's there's precious little column space between the doors. It's only about this wide between the doors, and, and we've got to hold up, you know, the door structure. So just moving out the front, opening up the front wall, would not help us achieve better bays. One, one other thing on that, it, so if I may, uh, how wide are they now, Chief? Twelve feet. Twelve by twelve. Twelve. And what's the width of a typical, the largest piece of equipment you have? About eight and a half to nine feet. But to widen the doors, like, like you were saying, the overall building is now gonna get wider and wider. And the left side of the screen here, we're encroaching on the property line. So that's some, uh, over the, here. Uh, actually, you're right, right here. So we're encroaching on the, on the property line, so we have to be aware of that too. We can only go over so far. Um, if you go back to the floor plan, so in, in this photo um, or slide, you'll see in this area here, we currently have apparatus back there. Um, what this does by creating the addition in the back, and we're moving those apparatus out of that area, and then we're strategically moving some of the smaller apparatus around, giving us more space between the bumpers and the doors, as, as Jeff was saying. Um, this does, as Rebecca mentioned, get every single vehicle inside, including the chief's car, the pickup truck, the trailer, um, every piece of equipment we have. We have a brush truck that's sitting outside right now and due to the, uh, the harsh conditions of the weather, the paint's starting to peel off of it. It's gonna cost us money to repair that. Um, obviously, we wanna take as good of care of the equipment as we can because it's, it's costly to the citizens of the town. Go ahead. So we have one, one way out of the station right now. Um, one thing I've talked about in the past, and, and I don't remember if we talked about it in this, this option, is right now we have overhead electrical lines. Um, when we did have the tornado, that pole almost came down and blocked our, our way out of the station. Um, I would recommend putting everything underground. Uh, that way that is you know, not a possibility in the future. There is a small town owned access road back here. Um, and when we did have some major storms, we did have to use that road in the past. It's, it's very tight, there's houses on both sides, so it's, it's limited what they could do. Um, I think, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we can put our engines back there, it's just we have to be very careful and it's a tight turn on to uh, Park Ave after that. If there's no more questions, we thank everybody for their time. Um, these are recorded and available um, for you to rewatch, and we hope that we see you in April um, at the station open house. Thank you.